Alex, uh, if you're reading your little bio, is uh, a scientist, he's a journalist. I like the fact that he is genuinely, in his spirit, an artist, my hero. He's also a Greek person, <laughs> so he loves to kiss. <laughs> and, um, and he's enormously productive. When he was here last, he, uh, he showed us some stuff from a book called From Conception to Birth. Uh, barely a month or two has gone by. He's got another book coming. It's called The Architecture and Design of Man and Woman. Take a deep breath. Alex Tsiaris. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to start off by showing you a film of some of the work that we did previously, a short film, and then I'll show you, you're the first to see this new book. Actually, we just sent it to the printer last week, so these are the, you're the first to see it, so I'm very anxious to see you know, your interpretation of it. Could we uh, dim the lights and show that film, please? switch to my computer, please. The, um, what we've done since that time, have written a whole host of new algorithms and basically have been working with a number of organizations. Actually, one of our principal collaborators, a guy named Paul Lauterborough, has just won the Nobel Prize uh, for inventing, being co-founder of the, uh, co-inventor of the MRI machine. And so we work with um, cutting edge technologies to acquire the data and we do the software side. In essence, what we wanted to do was sort of marvel at the development of the body, how it's sort of a babushka system and how things fit inside each other. And what we did is use a series of different kinds of modality. Everything that you're going to see is actually real human data. So we start here, and what we did is we actually scanned people in our office, uh, which was uh, interesting because one of the problems you have is that sometimes when you're actually the, our chief of scientific visualization did his own genitals, which ended up with a, you know, sizable difference. <laughs> so you have to be very careful when you do this about skewing your data. <laughs> but here, one of the beauties of being able to take this, I mean, in the future, what's going to happen with most of these machines uh, is that you'll be able to actually go in and be scanned in 4D. And what we did, though, is that you can do it in parts. We, we wrote programs to be able to actually put people back in positions as they would be in their natural environments. So as we scanned them, then we wrote a number of algorithms of inverse kinematics so you could actually move them. But the more important part was really the marvel. Actually, when you take a look at you know, the body and the beauty, I mean, it's like a Rodin sculpture, but the innervation and the, con you know, the, the complexity of the body needing to speak to each other. And then again, if you take a look at it from an architectural perspective, I mean, you have this magnificent column going down your back and from that, this innervation, all of these, that's why someone can touch you here and tell you exactly which part of your back of that nerve actually it's coming out of. And, but if you just look at it, it's a magnificent architectural structure. That's why we looked at it, being artists and journalists and scientists, it's one is you're sitting there saying there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing to compare with the beauty and the complexity of these models as just designed uh, here. What we wanted to do is sort of make you, help you understand how these little sub-compartments. Here in the you know, beautiful piece of bone, one of the problems that you have in doing the kind of what we refer to as segmentation, pulling an object out of the hole, is that when you look at classic medical illustration, everything has perfect boundaries. But really the beauty of the body is that everything's tethered to everything else. When you do a kind of a classic algorithm, which is you seed a value like in the kidney and you say, find me all other kidney values, you realize the fact that the kidney is speaking to all these other body parts and it just bleeds throughout the entire volume of the information. So you have to go in and sort of find and, and, and marvel at that kind of complexity of that conversation. The body is not independent, the kidneys are not. Everything is speaking to everything all the time. And if you come in and take a look at the structure, I mean the hard bone in the outside, this beautiful trabeculi, 
which actually means little, uh, in Latin, it means uh, little arches, are just these fillers that basically give the bone tremendous strength, but basically are, are almost light as air. And every part of the body, as you get closer and closer, now this is your bone. If you get really, really close up on it, layers and layers and layers of mineral, mineralized collagenates. I mean, basically, this is calcified um, collagen. And if you get at that close range, you'll realize that the architecture and design of the body is based on genetic information, that there are only about six designs that we looked at, not only in the body, that are used over and over and over. This layering system was one of the principal ones. And it's used for strength, it's used for flexibility, it's used for depth but it's a marvelous kind of concept. Uh, and we'll look at some of the other structures in just a moment. What we wanted to do is scan uh, a man and woman basically had a, an embryo so that we could actually see these body parts. We tried to take obviously a different, we tried to create a kind of a humanized look at, at the body rather than looking like it was flailed. We wanted to make sure that it had a certain kind of an elegance and a kind of a humanity, making it kind of like the anatomical renderings of, of you know, beautiful portraits of almost family portraits of your insides. And then here, looking at the complexity and the beauty of, of this kind of vascularization, if you have to think that you have, 30, you have 30 trillion cells in your body and all of them need fuel, and they have to bring not only nutrients but to specific places. And again, coming back to the idea that you know, as we scan people, we try to keep you know, elements of their humanity so that you could, it's sort of like a portal, an, an elegant portal into the system of another person. This is just a, a cross-section of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a high voltage electron microscope image of vascularization. Of your 60,000 miles of vascularization in your body, only one mile is visible. The rest of it is, inv is invisible because it's just capillaries going near every cell in your body, taking away oxygen and, you know, basically taking, I mean, bringing you oxygen and taking away waste. It's just an extraordinary system of beauty. Simultaneously, these little nodes, part of your, your the, the system of basically taking the inflammation or the immune system, this is, again, it's part of your circulatory system. Everyone thinks that basically the, the, the uh, blood is the only circulatory system, but your lymphatic system is as well. And each one of these nodes represents places where pathogens may get trapped. A lot of times what happens is that pathogens will get trapped in a node, and then basically all the immunological system will go there. A lot of times you'll start to feel a little pain under here, so it's, that's normally fighting off a virus or a bacteria. But it's, it is amazing, again, as to the complexity. And it grows, it starts very, very young. Um, one of the beauties is that the mother is not just a, a heart-lung machine. She is bringing not only nutrients, but she is also bringing the immunological uh, information to the child. And then when the child is born, one of the things that's fascinating is the mother kisses the, the head of the child, or kisses the child, picks up pathogens from the child. She makes antibodies. The antibodies are then put into the breast milk and fed to the child again. So once again, the construct of this and the complexity of the interchange is magnificent. The lungs, again, an optimal system. How do you actually pack so much nutrient and need into the surface? You create these kinds of alveoli and these branches, these bronchial trees, and these alveoli come out. And if you actually unfold it, it'll be about the size of a tennis court. It's extraordinary as to how much surface area. And this is the kind of design patterns that we saw over and over and over of the body, of the curling or curving. As you see in the digestive system, you've got this long tube that goes down and then starts to curve. The tube brings it to the stomach, the stomach starts to chew it up, and then basically as it curves, as you're trying to pull it, you're trying to slow it down so that you can take some time to break down those little pieces and actually use them for nutrition. This is something quite extraordinary. If you were to relate your DNA, just a piece of DNA, you have 46 of them in your 30 trillion cells, just a single piece of DNA to the size of a basketball hoop, which is about 10 feet. If you were to uncoil it, your next shot would be to Pluto. And now you have 46 of these inside 30 trillion cells. The mathematical model for that kind of compression is inconceivable. And not only does it have that kind of information, but you can, how does it have the intelligence to know when to go and unravel a specific part of it and then copy a protein from there? And just, to, I'm going to conclude right now. <laughs> huh? Okay. Uh, one of the things here was, was sort of interesting was that in our next book, <laughs> if I had the penis images, I would have bought more time. <laughs> um, just uh, our next, one of our next books, uh, this is the second book in our series on human development. And the second piece here, you're actually looking at the memory glands 
uh, before uh, childbirth, now at childbirth in the center, and then basically after childbirth. And the body is changing, the adaptability of the body over a period of time. One of, the, one of our next books is to actually follow the body as it goes through life from the moment it's conceived to the day um, you go into advanced age. And the last section of the book was, uh, in every chapter, is a section called Mirrors in Nature. The beauty of what you looked at in relationship to the perfect design is in all forms of genetic information. All species have it. We have approximately six patterns of development that are used over and over and over again. There's a genius to genetic design that we did not understand before we started this book. And what we did at the end of each chapter was take sections from the, from the human anatomy and matched it against identical uh, geometric and architectural forms of other species. It's something to marvel at, it's something to respect. It was an experience that, you know, we felt privileged to have and privileged to show you today. Thank you.